us arise to hear the word of our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, after the Magi had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt. And remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt... I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruler over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Well, let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, the children of Bethlehem offer you praise by the death they suffered for Christ. May our lives bear witness to the faith we profess with our lips, and may we likewise be ready to suffer and to die for the Holy One of God, the blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose most glorious and precious and holy name we ask this of you. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, why are the brand new parents, Mary and Joseph, taking their child into their arms when they should be sleeping? Why in the middle of the night is the Holy Family leaving Bethlehem and in fact fleeing their homeland altogether and making for the foreign territory of Egypt? And the answer, simply put, is because for people like them it's about to get very very ugly. The day of January 1 is in the life of the church, as I shared with the children, the feast of the name of Jesus. At God's appointed time in the future, it is the name at which every knee in heaven and on the earth and under the earth will bow. But that time is not yet. While it is even now in this day, the name which the angels and the heavenly hosts exalt and laud and magnify, it is not the case 
that this name is exalted and magnified in all the earth. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the cause of great joy in a believer's heart. But as the aged Simeon would say to Mary when the child was eight days old and she had presented him to the Lord in the temple, her son would be the cause for hearts to be pierced. And the truth is that some of those hearts are pierced figuratively, yes, as perhaps we could say of his mother Mary. And some, some hearts are pierced quite literally. It is the eighth day of Christmas, eight maids a milking, as the song would say, uh, the eighth day of Christmas for us. And so the carols of the season, if you were to ride along with me in my car, um, would be playing. I don't know if any of you are doing that, but I do uh, honor the 12 days of Christmas, and I do have um, the, the carols still playing. And um, one that I musically enjoy immensely is one whose lyrics pretty much keep it off the playlist. I refer to the Coventry carols. Anybody know the Coventry carol? Its name um, for, the, for its place of origin, which was Coventry, England, and it absolutely, in my opinion, demands a madrigal choir to do it justice. And that style of a cappella singing, for my money, is a, a perfect blend um, for this lyric and tune known as the Coventry Carol. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have the kind of voice to reproduce that for you, but what I will do is I'll kind of read the verses. Luli, lule, thou little tiny child, bye-bye, luli, lule. Luli, lule, thou little tiny child, bye-bye, luli, lule. O sisters too, how may we do for to preserve this day? This poor youngling for whom we sing, bye-bye, luli, lule. Herod the king, in his raging, charged he that this day his men of might in his own sight, all children young, to slay. Then, woe is me, poor child, for thee, and ever mourn and say, for thy parting neither say nor sing. Bye-bye, luli, lule. It's not easy to find a carol devoted to the story of our text. As far as I know, this is the only one, but it truly does capture, does it not, the spirit of Rachel's mourning and weeping. And what I believe makes the carol and our text for this day so poignant for us this morning is that the slaughter of the innocents is yet very much with us in 2016, now 2017. This is not a moment that belongs solely to ancient Bethlehem and the time of Mary and Joseph, but it is a present reality as well. And I do not want us to forget that on this eighth day of Christmas, the feast of the name of Jesus. The Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, we don't see eye to eye a whole lot, but three years ago, I wish to share with you words that he spoke. 
And I have added it down considerably for the sake of brevity, and yet I'm mindful it's still a, it's a bit lengthy. But I believe, nonetheless, it's worth our hearing as we contemplate our biblical text from St. Matthew chapter 2 and our current time. And here's what Prince Charles had to say. For myself, I have for some time now been deeply troubled by the growing difficulties faced by Christian communities in various parts of the Middle East. It seems to me that we cannot ignore the fact that Christians in the Middle East are increasingly being deliberately targeted by fundamentalist Islamist militants. Christianity was literally born in the Middle East, and we must not forget our Middle Eastern brothers and sisters in Christ. Their church communities link us straight back to the early church. As I was reminded by hearing Aramaic, our Lord's own language spoken and sung a few hours ago, he's referencing a worship service. And yet today the Middle East and North Africa has the lowest concentration of Christians in the world. Just 4% of the population. And it is clear that the Christian population of the Middle East has dropped dramatically over the last century and is falling still further. This has an effect on all of us, although, of course, primarily on those Christians who can no longer continue to live in the Middle East. We all lose something immensely and irreplaceably precious when such a rich tradition dating back 2,000 years begins to disappear. It is, therefore, especially delightful to see such a rich panoply of church life here today, including the Antiochian, Greek, Coptic, Syrian, and Armenian Orthodox churches, the Melkite, Marianite, Syrian, Catholic, Chaldean, and Roman Catholic churches, as well as the Church of the East, and churches established, dare I say it, somewhat more recently, including the Anglican Church. He's addressing church leaders. And saying all this about the difficulties facing the Christian churches in the Middle East, I am, of course, conscious that they are not the only faith community in the region suffering at the moment, nor is the Middle East the only part of the world in which Christians are suffering. But given the particularly acute circumstances faced by the church communities in the Middle East today, I felt it worthwhile to draw attention to their current plight. Surely there is no better time to do so than at Christmas to remind all of us that an emphasis on love of neighbor and doing to others as we would have them do to us are the ultimate foundations of truth, justice, compassion, and human rights. Such profound wisdom is at the very heart of all three religions, however obscured the message may have become. He and I would take issue on that. My prayer this afternoon is for all beleaguered communities, and I believe that Western Christians ought to pray earnestly for fellow believers in the Middle East. Okay. And so now I ask you to note and add to your remembrance, well, let's say, how about the victims of this Christmas market terrorist assault that we witnessed earlier this month in Berlin when a truck was used to run over people, killing a dozen innocents and injuring scores of others as they sought to celebrate the festivities of this holy season. I further ask you to offer a prayer of gratitude for those in Melbourne, Australia, who a few weeks ago were rescued, as it were, by Australian police who were able to arrest five men now accused of planning a Christmas Day terror attack targeting a number of landmarks in Melbourne, that country's second largest city. You might find it interesting 
that Luther, in a Christmas sermon on this text, said there was weeping because of this bloodhound Herod. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted as, he says, when the Turk, which is that time's designation for Mohammedans or Islamists, as when the Turk invades our land and snatches the children from the breasts of their mother because they were invading Austria at that time. Vienna was under assault. And you know the situation in Spain with Ferdinand and Isabella. And so I say, my friends in Christ, it is tragic that Christians are being persecuted and murdered around the world for naming the name of Jesus. And it is important, vital perhaps, that you and I open our eyes and see that the days of Rachel weeping and mourning and the suffering and the death experienced by the infants in Bethlehem. That's today's story, people. It is today's story, every bit as much as it was when Joseph woke Mary in the middle of the night to take baby Jesus and flee to Egypt. Because I assure you this morning, there are more Christians dying for the name of Jesus right now in our lifetime, that ever died in Herod's slaughter of the children in Bethlehem. Horrible as that was. And so, may we remember before heaven's throne all those who have lost home or freedom or family or, or yes, even life itself. Because they named that sacred name above all others. I want to say to you this morning as strongly as I can that we, you and I, we must be in prayer for these, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who suffer for the name of Jesus in this year of 2017. It is January 1, the feast of the name of the Lord, the feast of the name Jesus. January 1, New Year's Day. And so I submit to you, if you want a New Year's resolution that you have half a chance of keeping, try that. Pray for these, my brothers and sisters, who suffer and who die for that name above all names. Amen.